All right, super. So you've been, you've been sitting for about 30 minutes, so why don't you all just stand up for 30 seconds and, and stretch. And the people in the back, I invite you to move forward. So everyone just stand up, stretch. Shake your legs a bit. People in the back, move forward. Surrender your devices. Listen to the message this afternoon and said, okay, please have a seat. The year was 1998. The location was Upi. Where is Upi? It's just outside of Delhi. And I was with our managing director of the company I worked for at the time, and we were having a performance conversation with one of the other directors that reported to the managing director. And it was a, one of those difficult conversations that quite often we dread having. We scripted it all out well in advance, a few days in advance before I arrived to India. We, need, we knew we needed to have this conversation. So we uh, planned it out on the phone. And then when I landed in Delhi, we sat down, the managing director and I, Ranjan, and we mapped out how we were going to approach this performance issue. And then finally, we went into the meeting. And we were very scripted. And we had the right questions, uh, in my view, at the time. But the other director, the subordinate for the managing director, was really resisting the conversation. And he failed to really understand where he was at the root of the cause of the results failure that was starting to happen in the business, in his particular line of business, actually. And as the meeting continued on for maybe 25, 30, past 30 minutes, he continued to resist the conversation and resist the conversation and placing the responsibility on different circumstances that were taking place in the environment. So meanwhile, we're following the script, and then we start to go back and we repeat the script, trying to reinforce our points. And suddenly, Ranjan went off script, and he asked, look into your heart. Look into your heart. And in that moment, the conversation transformed. And I remember looking down at the paper and thinking to myself, Ranjan, that's not on the script. What, where is this coming from? Because I had never heard that question before. And looking back over the years, what I realized is that Ranjan was actually practicing love as a leadership skill in that moment. He was appealing to a very different side of the employee in that particular moment. So what I want to talk to you about today is love as a leadership skill. And I want you to look into your heart and look into the world and what do you see? Well, when I look out in the world over the last couple of years, I think that the whole world needs to take a deep breath. You just look at the headlines, the headlines this morning in India. Very sad headlines. Headlines globally around the world, the political environment we're in. Everybody's really wound up, and everyone needs to take a very deep breath. I would say, based on my research over the years and my career, the biggest modern leadership issues that we have, despite the amazing message that's coming out from this conference, which is very uh, in encouraging and empowering and resonates with my talk, the leadership issues are we still have lots of occasions of ego within, our business, within the businesses, within the management ranks. We have low emotional quotient. We have fixed mindset, people who are rigid in their ways, and leaders who are resistant to change, and employees too. And we have what I call failure nexus. And failure nexus is a weak relationship to failure. So this morning, uh, the trust talk talked about what happens in organizations that have trust. In organizations that have trust, when people fail, they get over it, and they encourage people that fail to make mistakes, and they don't uh, hurt people that make mistakes. But we have too, much, too many organizations that actually are um, encouraged or faulting people when they make mistakes. I'm just going to grab a little bit of water here. The other thing is what I, uh, amygdala 
hijack in leaders. How many people here have heard of an amygdala hijack? Okay. So you're going to learn something new today, except for Nina. An amygdala hijack comes from the sympathetic nervous system in the brain. This is the part of the brain that's responsible for fight, flight, freeze. When you see a tiger in front of you a thousand years ago, or maybe uh, in modern history, I hope not, um, or when you're in a threatening situation. The amygdala, a small part of the brain, literally seizes control of the brain in highly threatening situations. If you're about to have a head-on collision and you're at the wheel of the car, the instinct to pull the car away from the danger is your amygdala seizing control of the brain. Now, what does that look like in the environment? It would look like executives acting behaviorally, be, uh, behaving badly. It would look like leaders behaving badly. That's what amygdala hijack would look like. It might also look like a, ex an executive who is having a temper tantrum uh, or being very, very um, difficult with their employees and berating their employees and treating them in a way that's really disempowering. And then afterwards, after the amygdala lets go and things cool down and uh, the brain returns to normal, people often reflect back on that incident and think, what was I thinking in that moment? What allowed me to behave like that? Now, that kind of reflection is good if people can learn to interrupt the amygdala, which you actually can do. But it's not good if you resist the uh, corrective behavior, if you resist the reflection, and you can't actually uh, stop yourself from losing your uh, cool when you have a temper tantrum. The World Economic Forum in 2015 published their Global Leadership Index, and we're probably due for a refresh one of these days. But they said that the world was in a global, uh, worldwide leadership crisis. And probably things have not changed that much since uh, 2015. Edelman, an organization that monitors trust around the world, and they've had three runs of their survey uh, since about 2012, 2015, and 2017, they're saying that globally, the trust in leaders is declining, especially in governments. And unfortunately, what they saw in 2017, after the 2015, is it had eroded a lot in businesses. The one area where it hasn't eroded is in NGOs, well, it has eroded less, is in NGOs and charities. So there's more trust in those types of organizations than there are in uh, governments and commercial organizations. And so it's no surprise when we see the data from ADP this morning that show that a poor manager was the number, one of the number one reasons why, why employees leave organizations. The research repeatedly shows you they're consistently in the top two this morning or top th five or top ten results when surveys are run. Employees join companies and they leave managers most of the time or a lot of the time. Uh, the latest um, big research on this was Gallup, that overwhelmingly, about 70% um, of the time, the employees are leaving because of manager behavior. Now, that's not what we just heard from Sharon. Everybody deserves a great leader. So what's wrong with this picture? Well, obviously, we've seen some data today that tells us that not everybody has a great leader. But some people do. And I want you to imagine it that these people that are great leaders are almost pouring leadership into their environment. I want you to imagine it as like this warm liquid in a pot that is being poured and with lots and lots of kind of steam and, and uh, dry ice and things like that. So that this liquid is pouring into a big cauldron and the cauldrons are the employees and the uh, the the mist is coming out of the cauldron and pouring over the rest of the employees. It's a special type of leadership. And it's where the magic happens. The magic that we heard about this morning when there is high trust between employees. When often, as a leader, you're outside of your comfort zone, which I'll talk about in a minute, why we would be outside of our comfort zone. But the magic that we're talking about is practicing love as a leadership skill. Now, this leadership style, if you think about it, 
should not be lost on you here in India because there is a very high-profile CEO on the planet who started in India. Anybody want to take a guess who that was? He's known for his leadership skills. Sachin Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, has spent over 25 years with Microsoft, and he started here in India. In fact, I think he started with Microsoft in Hyderabad as a very junior employee. He has transformed Microsoft since he took over the CEO. He's created more shareholder gains for Microsoft um, as the CEO in his reign than actually the entire history of the Microsoft since it went public uh, as an IPO. So he's created more shareholder value as CEO than pre um, his, his predecessors. He is known for his extraordinary leadership style, which is, has a certain type of empathetic style, love as a leadership skill. Now, when we think of love as a leadership skill and we look into our lives, love in the workplace is a very foreign concept for a lot of people because they would think, whoa, love, that's kind of really uncomfortable. I mean, does that mean on Valentine's Day yesterday I have to send all my employees roses? Is that what I have to do? That would be awkward, especially if we're in HR and we're supposed to be the guardians of those, you know, those rules that we don't get too close to our employees. And when we look at our models of love, many of them come from when we grew up and how our family related to one another. And families all express love to each other very, very differently. Some families are extremely demonstrative and very physical and huggy, and other families are more, you know, less, less demonstrative. Some families are uh, very, uh, they speak with uh, affirmations, and they say, I love you all the time, and other families are not like that. They might have other ways to express their love, such as doing things for your uh, children or for other members of your family, which would be acts of service, or uh, giving things, such as acts of gift, which is a form of love. So our style of love as a leadership skill, which we may not have even thought about until today or until this hour, will be very much impacted by how we related to love in our families as we were growing up, or if you're in your current family, if you're married, for example. But love as a leadership skill, what does that look like? Well, it looks like, it doesn't look like sending roses to your, to your employees on Valentine's Day. But it looks like professional intimacy and empathy. And Satya Nadella is known for his uh, style of empathy. It's about knowing and caring for your employees, understanding their personal lives, what's important to them, and knowing what's appropriate to discuss with them and having compassion for them and being tender-hearted towards them, especially when they're having a difficult time. So if they have a failure, you might stop when you're having a performance conversation with them and have a different type of conversation with them, such as, hold on a second, look into your heart. What is really going on here? Are you with me so far? Okay, thank you. Now, these two models of, um, this model of love as a leadership skill is very much in contrast to a traditional model of leadership skill, which we've heard a little bit in some of the speakers this morning. The traditional model of leadership is very top-down. It's directive, not when the oxygen masks drop down and the pilot says, put on the mask, and you say, thank you very much for that instruction. That's helpful. But it's a heroic model of leadership which pushes other people down in order to get ahead. I've been studying neuroscience a lot in the last three to four years. And one of the things uh, that's come out of the research around neuroscience is how people relate to power and how when they get into positions of power, they forget the power that they forget. They sort of forgot the power that got them into power. Um, uh, and then reverse that and use that power for their own gain. 
that is completely opposite from what we heard from Sharon in terms of assume positive intent. People come to work every day to do the best that they can, to do a good job, to create value. I totally believe that. Always assume positive intent. But this yellow style of leadership, the heroic style of leadership top down, does not always assume positive intent. It's heroic, ergo, I am the hero, the leader, because you, the employees, are not. Now, I know that's a really kind of harsh thing to say, but there are leaders out there who are operating in that kind of model. You contrast that with a more loving, nurturing leadership style, can still be directive, but it's more about serving others. And we call that, there are many different models uh, around serving others. One, servant leadership, authentic leadership, situational leadership, collaborative leadership. There's many different models of leadership that are encouraging a bottoms-up, empowering type of approach. The, leadership, the research also supports an empathetic, trusting leadership style. There have been a, there's been a lot of research into this. Um, two big pieces of research. One of them comes out of the Australian School of Business. Uh, where they studied uh, 5,600 people in 77 organizations, Christina Bucke, and also uh, DDI, Development um, Dimensions International, a very, very well-known international training company that did a massive study across many, many industries and many organizations. And what they learned is that empathetic, compassionate leaders and leaders that have the ability to listen and respond with empathy to their staff directly impact organizational performance in terms of the bottom line, cost cutting, shareholder value, performance metrics across the board, including employee engagement. This is the message that's coming out of all of the research. Why do we never hear about these organizations and these leaders? Quite often, we don't hear about them because another major characteristic of this leadership style is humility. And the hum humble leaders will not go out and pound the pavement and go out and get the press coverage that says, look how great I am, because that's just not their style. They go about their life very, very quietly, but they're very effective, and they create results practicing love as a leadership skill. So how do we practice professional intimacy? Well, to give you one quick example, and this does not make me special in any way, uh, but it was a, a bit of a task. One of the ways that I've poured love into my organization is that I've actually, I took on a project a couple of years ago to write employees' personal notes. And since I started that project about four years ago, I have written personal notes to over 3,000 employees within ESF. Uh, it's about 700, 800 a year that I'm doing at a time. And I'm not alone in this endeavor. It's somewhat caught fire a little bit, and people have started writing notes to one another, and people even wrote notes back into me, thanking me for the notes. And the message in the notes was all encouraging messaging. It was all, thank you for the great job you do. We appreciate you. Keep doing that. That's a great thing that you accomplished, and keep working on that project. That's the message um, that um, I'm sending out in my notes. But the key things to look at when you're practicing professional intimacy is passionately knowing your employees. So how many of you in here have employees, and you know the names of their kids, and you know their hobby? What do they love to do on the weekends? What do they do when they're not at work? That's a great question to ask your, um, yourself. And I, one of the things I do when I do executive coaching is I ask the people I coach, do you know the answer to that question? I coach some startups in Hong Kong, and I often ask the startup CEOs, OK, tell me about the 15 people. What are their favorite hobbies? And one guy had no idea. And all, it was a revelation, and he thought to himself, wow, I better go out and figure out what the answer to that question. And it's also having a real commitment to their success. So the number one thing in the ADB's research this morning 
around why um, employees leave organizations, the retention issue, was career development. That number one issue is not independent of managers because a leader has direct impact on the career of an employee. A manager and a leader, they are the biggest ambassadors for another employee when it comes to a promotion and uh, advancing them in the organization elsewhere and giving them opportunities. So it, professional intimacy, love as a leadership skill, means knowing your employees, being compassionate and empathetic, and having a real commitment to their success. This is starting to really catch fire around the world, the notion of being an empathetic company or having an empathetic leadership style, to the point that organizations are, um, that there's an organization called the Empathy Organization that creates, or the Empathy Business, that creates the Empathy Index. And they actually look at organizations that are known for uh, being empathetic. And Southwest Airlines was known for um, having empathetic practices immediately following 911. In the days following 911, when all the other organizations were bracing for impact in terms of the cost cutting that they expected because of the impact on the airline industry, Southwest Airlines instructed, they drove up their own costs by instructing their employees to go out and take, everybody was stranded in cities all over the United States, and they instructed their employees to go out and take the customers bowling, take them to movies, take them to dinner and spend time with them because we understand what you're going through. We're going through it together. We're all stranded together. We're all hurting together. It was a shared experience, and they wanted Southwest Airlines to experience that as customers. Neuroscience supports empathetic leadership. Mirror neurons in the, or in the brain um, pick up and resonate with other people within your proximity. You may have had an experience of watching a, watching a sports match, maybe rugby, for example, and somebody gets hit really hard, smack, and everyone in the arena will say, ooh, that, wow, that hurt. That ooh is the mirror neuron firing. And some people, when they watch sports matches, you may have even noticed this with yourself, are so passionate and excited about the sports matches that when they see those hits, they actually have a reflexive movement in their own muscles. And those are actually the mirror neurons that um, are firing and uh, causing the muscles to have an automatic reflex. This comes out of the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the cooling system in the brain. It's where mood is, it's where peace is, and um, it's, what the, it's where the brain will say to the amygdala hijack, cool down, take it easy, calm down, calm down. So the one thing I want to leave with you um, is a switching, switches gears a little bit, but I think it's relative, uh, relevant to being a leader who practices professional intimacy, who practices love as a leadership skill. And it um, echoes with what Sharon told us at the end of her talk. Leaders need personal reflection time. And I was recently at a conference where a man, uh, one of the leaders from the Institute for the Future, was speaking at the conference. He had a fascinating talk, and one of the things that he said is, the biggest barrier that the Institute for the Future sees in the future is leaders' lack of personal quiet time. Leaders' lack of personal quiet time. That means stopping and reflecting and planning and thinking about your own life, thinking about your employee's life, your family's life, your friend's lives. So you need to love one another. And I invite you, as I conclude, to look into your heart. What can you do today to lead with love? Thank you very much.